Hey, hey, hey! Welcome everyone for another Wasabi Research Club conversation. This time we are going to go through a paper from Paul Severson uh, called Why I'm Not an Anthropist. Uh, the author is the inventor of the Onion Routing Protocol. He's not working on Tor right now. And since Aviv is not here, there is no presentation on this paper right now. So I'm just going to, to read the abstract, uh, one line from the conclusion, and let's see where we go from there. So, what does it mean to be anonymous in network communications? Our central thesis is that both the theoretical literature and the deployed systems have gotten the answer essentially wrong. The answer have been wrong because they apply the wrong metric to the wrong adversary model. I indicate problems in the established adversary models and metrics for anonymity as well as implications for the design and analysis of anonymous communication systems. So this is the abstract. It might be too abstract, but <laughs> but there was a nice quote from the paper that that actually explains what, what it really wants wants to to prove that the central the central point is that the model on which all existing work on anonymity the anthropist model is broken for open or widely shared communications. So he doesn't like the the anthropist model that's that's the point there and why we'll see soon unfortunately the the author i couldn't reach him maybe i sent the message to the wrong email address uh, so he's not with us however we have with us harry from neem network who has some interesting context on the on how this paper came around and what the author might be thinking might was thinking when when he he did this paper so harry i give the words to you so could you start over what you what you started saying just before the show yeah so i'll just give a, a little bit of maybe an introduction to this paper um you know so so two two sort of notes first of all um this paper comes from a, a long-standing argument um, around how to build anonymous communications. And I think in order to understand why this building anonymous communication systems are difficult, it's useful to, to compare them to classical cryptography. So, you know, for years people built crypto systems and maybe they worked, maybe they didn't. Uh, and eventually, um, they, they sort of boiled it down to a methodology called provable security. But you had a, a well-defined adversary say, well, you know, this adversary is given... I'm sorry, we are losing you. Uh, your voice is just getting uh, lower and lower uh, and lower. Maybe it's the internet. Is this better? No, it's not. Is anyone hearing it? Like that? Yeah. Yeah, I'm here. Um, I'll just try to get as close to the microphone okay, as possible. <laughs> yeah, no, better? it's good. Yeah. Okay, so I'll just what I what I was trying to say is that essentially anonymous communication systems, people were building them, but they didn't really have any principles to understand why one design would be better than another design. So in particular, you know, why would, for example, Tor, which is called an onion routing system, be better or worse uh, than a mixed network? And a lot of this comes from essentially a, a misunderstanding that happened very early, uh, around probably 2003 or four, when Tor came out. So. Paul Syverson, weirdly enough, was a philosopher, and like many philosophers, he, he couldn't find a job. And essentially, the U.S. Navy 
didn't have huge budgets, so they hired philosophers because they knew about logic and they thought they could train them into computer scientists cheaper than actually hiring computer scientists. And one day, one of Paul's friends had this, he said, well, Paul, would it be possible every time I connect to the internet, I leak uh, my IP address? And would it be possible uh, to build a system where this doesn't happen? And Paul had never thought about this question before. His background was actually in something called epistemic logic. But he kind of had this concept, which became onion routing. And the concept is basically the only way uh, you can get anonymity is by passing a message uh, through essentially a network of strangers. And, you know, at each point, there's a layer of encryption, you unwrap it. And that, that was really genuinely um, kind of Paul's insight. Um, now, the problem is Paul was not aware that David Chom and other people had been working on mixed networks uh, since the 80s. And mixed networks basically said if you have a sender and a receiver, uh, you hand packets to a mixer, uh, and they basically shuffle these packets like a deck of cards they mix them and then they launch them all out at the same time and because they've all been sort of launched at the same time and their order has been essentially randomly permuted uh you can't tell if the packets are encrypted as long as different senders are sending packets to the mixer and different receivers are getting it that the packets uh who the senders and receivers are um and that's the goal of sender and receiver unlinkability. And mixed networks were built so that even an adversary, which is observing the entire network, um, you know, for example, the NSA, couldn't tell which sender was sending which message to what receiver with any real advantage. Now, what Paul... Now, people kind of, you know, mixed networks said they did this, but there's no really way to quantify. There's a bunch of different mixed network designs. Which design is, is better than another? For example, should you have one mixer? Should you have a chain of mixers? Uh, should you have a peer-to-peer -peer network of mixes? There was all these different designs being thrown around. And eventually, uh, George Denisis, uh, who was NIMS co-founder, but uh, unfortunately now at Libra, and Claudia Diaz, who, KU Lovin, but uh, also now at NIM, um, basically simultaneously thought up in 2004, they said, well, the, the way to measure an anonymity is not just an anonymity an set, but entropy. Entropy is a well-defined mathematical notion, and we can say that, you know, given one message, we can quantify what the possible centers of receivers are, uh, using entropy metrics, and we can also kind of chain those metrics so that we can say, well, the message has this much entropy at this hop, this much entropy after being mixed for so long, and this much entropy at another hop. And that's, Paul had no concept that that work was even going on. So he independently thought of onion routing and Tor, and then when he submitted the Tor paper to this uh, tech uh, conference called the Privacy Enhancing Technologies uh, Workshop, they basically said, oh, this is a weird mix that you've invented. And then Paul basically was like, well, that's not the point. I'm not trying to mix traffic. Tor doesn't mix traffic. We're not concerned about an adversary that watches the entire network. We're concerned about hiding IP addresses and, and you know, trying to open circuits, basically, to allow, and he thought this was a much more uh, real-world design. And now, actually, thanks to, to, to Snowden's latest book, Permanent Record, we actually know that before Tor, what would actually would happen is when the CIA wanted to, for example, do a Google search on someone, they basically had to open a whole operation, you know, basically buy a computer and go to some weird place, make a fake company, just to basically do Google searches without revealing an IP address that went back to, you know, CIA.gov. That's and, and, you know, Snowden said, well, Tor is great uh, because it just defended the IP address so the CIA didn't have to do, spend all this money anymore. 
and and tour is a great system. It's it's the and when Paul thought of tour, and Roger and Nick actually built it, it it was the only real working anonymity system. Mixed networks were only used for what was called uh, cypherpunk email remailers. So they, they would send anonymous emails to people, and people, to be honest, Mixmaster, which Nick from Tor worked on, and, and Roger, who eventually worked on Tor, worked on with George. Uh, these systems like Mixmaster from Lynn Sassaman and Mixminion from George, Roger, and Nick, they never really took off. They were used by cypherpunks, um, but they were kind of viewed as unusable and had all these problems. You would send the message. You never know if you got a response. Um, it was really tricky just, to, to, just to, to make sense of them for ordinary users. While, you know, Paul argued that Tor was really easy to did one thing and did it very well. And that he felt it did it, you know, what the people, the crazy people who are interested in mixed nets were doing was a bit wacky because in reality, you know, you don't have an anonymity set that most adversaries know about. The internet is not a, you know, uniformly connected. You can't send messages out all at the same time. The network has all these structured links kind of built into ISPs by default. And he actually argues, I think he argues in this paper pretty successfully, that even though Tor doesn't really fit this entropy-based um, way to define anonymity, anonymous communication systems, um, it's a it's a it's it, 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 it's fighting it's fighting a realistic adversary. So he's really arguing that entropy and anonymity sets are not the best way to measure the success. And the performance and the, just the capability of, an, of a real-world anonymous communication system. Uh, my opinion on this is at the time that Paul wrote this, he was basically right. But that now, weirdly enough, you know, 10, 20 years down the road, um, it's actually the threat that Paul feels unrealistic, an adversary that can watch the entire network and record all the communication between every link is actually realistic. So that's kind of my disagreement with Paul, but I think that's some context for the papers. Paul's trying to defend Tor against people who says, oh, this system, it doesn't really produce great entropy. It's not as good as a mixed net. It, you know, it doesn't really have a good definition for why it's anonymous or why it's more secure. Does that make sense, that explanation? Totally. Okay, so I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, I'd like to hear what people think about Tor and entropy and defining an anonymous communication. I'm just thinking that I always knew there's something wrong with Tor. <laughs> and that kind of like explained it in some sense. In some, some, some sense. I mean, I wouldn't say that there's anything wrong with Tor. It's just that what Paul's arguing is that Tor has a particular threat model, which is, you know, it's trying to hide the IP address and the origin of of large amounts of traffic. And that doesn't re that threat model, which is realistic, doesn't have anything really to do with entropy. Um, I mean, I would argue. Paul was right at the time, and now times have changed a bit, but I still think Paul has a point that anonymous systems aren't easily mathematically definable. And so in, in classical cryptography, you know, you have these very nice, precise, formal definitions of security. Like you have ciphertext and plaintext, and given some ciphertext, can I get to the plaintext? Can I fake a signature? Can I? I mean, these are very well-defined notions. And you don't really, and this is, I think, the philosophical point of the paper, you don't really have these definitions, in, at least in a, in a really well-understood form in anonymous communications. And maybe a simple, something simple which seems correct, like entropy, might not actually be the best way to define how an anonymous communication system should be judged. So sorry guys, I had to leave for five minutes, but I can I can actually say something what what you just said. I I I don't 
at least from my impression or impression, I'm pretty sure that this is not really about the title is a bit clickbaity. But this is not really about why he's he's not an anthropist. What what he's arguing is that entropy is not sufficient in quantifying anonymity because because of Tor. Because you cannot quantify because you cannot cannot put the entropist model into Tor. So you need some 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 more more things that how you would quantify the anonymity and compare it between different anonymity networks and he had an he had a solution proposal but uh, he doesn't really go into it and i didn't really understand it because this is a how he he puts it it's a breaking paper it's not a solution it's just just why the entropy metric would not be sufficient in, in, in comparing anonymity systems. Would would that be be the same impressions or 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 did you guys think that this this is really just just saying that no the entropy metric is completely wrong, we shouldn't use it? Yeah I mean that, that leads into the next question, right? Uh, if, if entropy might be a good model for communication, uh, uh, like anon anonymizing communications, e even if we think that it is that, is it still applicable to anonymizing Bitcoin transaction and to analyzing coin joints? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure. Yeah, actually, that's, that's a good point. That, uh, as I see it in, in coin joints, the the things what he's arguing is, is just not there because in coin joins really what really matters is the entropy because every information is somewhat there on the blockchain already so you ca you can cannot really go wrong with the entropy model there that that would be that that would have been my point there too Anyway, uh, any uh, more yeah, Adam, I actually agree both with you and Max here because uh, so far everything that you do in CoinJoin in a proper way, it's still relying on the entropy one way or another. Therefore, yes, everything that we have heard so far about Tor and its flaws and all that, in, and about the paper being against entropy and against entropy being valid, probably, I would say, or valuable enough for using in coin joints. Uh, there are thousands of methods to achieve thousands of goals. Therefore, I think we just need to understand whether the method should be applicable or probably a bit modified or actually useless for coin join case, which we are referring to right here during these calls. And I think that it might be um tweak like it can be tweaked but i do not think that we should just cross the entropy out of everything that we are doing in Quinjo. yeah i agree yeah i mean we have an entropy model exactly one for coin joins the Boltzmann entropy, which is maybe the Shannon entropy, <laughs> we don't know. But also, I I think that's that, that's that's really not a good good way to go about that because you you can get surprises if you are not uh, weighing in the 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 link link breaking stuff like what the Napsack paper actually worked out to a degree, so. So yeah, the entropy model, we, we should not drop it, that's for sure. But uh, in order to use it, we would have to work it out properly, right? <laughs> yeah, I, actually a question here. Where is the difference between Rennie entropy and Shannon entropy and Boltzmann entropy? Uh, we just talked about it last episode and we get to the conclusion that we don't know or 
what we think we know is not what the author thinks he knows. So, so I don't know. So, so the thing is that in the Boltzmann paper, wait, I want to do it quickly because this is not about the Boltzmann paper. So it, it, it's not even a paper, it's a gist. In the Boltzmann gist, the entropy looks like Shannon entropy. So I started calling it Shannon entropy under the comments and the author said that, oh, it's, it's not Shannon entropy. And well, okay, uh, the paper called Boltzmann, so it must be the Boltzmann entropy, right? But then now we've said, nah, there is no Boltzmann constant here, so it's not the Boltzmann entropy. And it looks like the Shannon entropy, so it must be the Shannon entropy. So it must be the Shannon entropy, but the author might know better and we don't have time to really investigate that and not even that important question. So, so uh, Adam, sorry for interrupting. Do I understand correctly that basically now there is no clear differentiation between those three types of entropies? I, I, I mean, I can answer this really briefly, which is the way to think about it is that Shannon is uh, entropy in bits. And so, you know, bits have you know, essentially, you know, it's two dimensions, everything's log base two. Um, Rini entropy basically says, well, let's imagine we can have entropy across multiple dimensions, you know, up to infinite numbers of dimensions and tries to capture that all within one measurement. So you can have entropy with three dimensions or four dimensions or five dimensions. At least that's how I understand it. But, I mean, for most computer science uh, uses of the term entropy, I think we're talking Shannon entropy. The other entropy versions are, to my understanding, which is, I think, quite limited in this regard, are, are mostly useful in, say, like physics, for example. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't get too hung up on it. I think basically people mean, including, I don't know why Paul mentions Rennie entropy in the beginning here, but I think... Most people basically, when they say entropy, they mean Shannon entropy. They don't really mean anything else. Mm. That, and we, we are talking about another paper that was the last last episode, uh, last session. That uh, the entropy was defined as follows. Uh, so, so the entropy, so the the gist is called Boltzmann. This thing called Boltzmann. So that would say that it is the Boltzmann entropy. But the entropy is defined as followed. Log 2 uh, and the number of possible valid combinations, which looks like the Shannon entropy, right? It does, unless there is some circumstances, for example, that this like semi-law operates or there is some additional condition or something like that. I mean, a lot of things in mathematics there are very similar to each other, unless there is like one condition that changes the whole thing and actually defines some, you know, some property, something like that. Mm. Anyway, um, yeah. So this this paper talked a bit about entropy too. That I don't even know what he. I mean, maybe all all he said is just his. Entropy in a way that different kind of entropy is that he's preferring the rainy entropy, right? Am I am I remembering right here? Okay, I remember well. <laughs> yes, so he prefers the rainy entropy for for some reasons. Huh. All right. I think maybe I mean it might be useful to talk about some of what Paul argues. So, 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 so what, what Paul's argument turns to entropy is he says, well, you know, you have this kind of theoretical way of measuring if someone's anonymous or not, but how useful is that in the real world? So, so Paul's like argument is he says, well, you know, he says that there, he actually calls it, if I remember correctly, the, the threat model of the man, right? Where he says, well, you know, the man can basically do anything, your network, watch all, all the nodes, 
uh, delay packets, drop packets, compromise, uh, compromise your the nodes in your anonymous communication network. And he says, you know, when you look at like what mixed nets were designed to fight, they were designed to fight an adversary that Paul, at least at the time he wrote this, feels isn't very realistic, which is a global passive adversary. So this is an adversary that can watch all of the communication in a network, all the inputs and the outputs and every single hop between every router and the internet. And he says, well, you know, imagine you have this perfect mixnet, which, you know, I think he actually calls out Mixmaster by name, which is the anonymous uh, email remailer that's, uh, you know, kind of came from the cypherpunks. And he says, you know, it's, it's great if you have a hundred people using this and those people, you know, the entropy, you can't distinguish them at all. So, you know, your entropy is like whatever, you know, to the eight, whatever, you know, like eight or eight or not, you know, something quite, quite eight or nine bits of entropy, right? So you can, you, you said, well, that's, that, that's great. You know, you have a fair amount of entropy, but push comes to shove, uh, you still have a, a very small amount of users. And then he says, look at Tor, which Tor doesn't even claim and explicitly doesn't claim to defend against adversaries that can watch the whole network. Uh, but then Paul says, well, it's not very realistic that they're watching the whole network. Instead, what they would do is they would attack particular routers. They would watch particular routers. They would you know, do denial of service attacks and all sorts of other stuff. And that this kind of adversary which I think he kind of at the end talks about being close to what's called the roving adversary, a sort of local adversary that's very powerful and that's very, can do kind of what's called active attacks, can actually modify and change packets rather than just writing them down. Uh, this kind of adversary is more realistic. It's, it's less resource. It's, it's a, Paul argues it's a huge amount of resources to copy every packet sent on the internet but it's not that many resources to copy all the packets sent through an individually suspicious router or every packet going to like an individually suspicious hidden service or Tor exit node, you know, whatever, going to the pirate bay. And, um, and I think that's actually a really strong argument. It's, it's not necessarily false. I, I think it's actually correct. And then what he argues is that, you know, mixed networks – the, if no one's using them, then is it really that anonymous? While if you look at Tor, Tor doesn't has a, a kind of poor entropy, isn't very good against global passive adversaries, but has a lot of users, is very diverse, and because Tor circuits keep switching every you know whatever ten minutes or so, so your entry node and your exit node and the path through the network changes every ten minutes or whatever the, the rate is, that it's very hard for an adversary to realistically intercept too much of your traffic. And, he, and, and so Paul's arguing that's a, a more, uh, this kind of local active attacks are much more realistic than these kind of global passive attacks. And I think that's a, an interesting question. Which model is more realistic and for what, quote unquote, the man can actually do. So I'd like to know what people think about that. I mean, you can't, but yeah, what you're, so you can't, can you, how can you even put the, the onion routing into a, into an entropist conception? There, there is, there is, you can't, can't do anything. You, you can't define entropy there. You, you can't do anything. Do you agree with that so far? Or, or you think there is an entropist model that properly covers the onion routing uh, use case? I, mean, I, I think it's, it's wrong to throw entropy out the window because you can say, well, you know, the, the set of all users of Tor assume that, you know, these packets are, these circuits are switched often enough, you know, are at least unlinkable in some regard to at least their IP address. But it is, 
tricky to think about to, to really because it's not actually true to basically say tour has an easily measured uh anonymity set instead it's it's better to say you know tour basically relies on a large peer-to-peer -peer network and a diversity of routers to to, to build a, some sort of practical notion of um, anonymity, and I think that that's not incorrect. That that being said, I I, I feel like Paul kind of what I would say throws the baby out with the bathwater. So I think you know it, it's not correct to say that mixed networks can only defend against global passive adversaries. There's lots of I mean, at the time when Paul wrote that, that was basically true. But nowadays, with like Lupix and Nim, we we've built active adversary attacks in, uh, and a lot of the issues which Paul highlights about mixed networks are are, are are issues of usability and performance. And while I think it's going to be very hard for mixed networks to achieve the performance of Tor, I do think. They're getting a lot better. Usability can be made a lot better. And entropy is still a valid metric. It shouldn't be the only metric, but it, it's if you can't really give indistinguishability between a global passive adversary, then it's not clear if your system is is actually anonymous in a strong sense because what where I, I kind of disagree with Paul is I think the NSA is effectively a global passive adversary. That it is, I mean, you know, maybe Iran can't pull it off. Maybe, you know, France can't pull it off. But I think the Americans combined at least GCHQ uh, can, because they control a, a, a lot of, they have insight to lots of routers, actually do a mass traffic analysis on a level which I think Paul thought was unrealistic. Yeah, but but the competing civil ideas came, came in here that... Uh, the NSA can't can't watch China's traffic, and China can't watch America's traffic, and and so on, right? The big CBs are competing with each other because they don't share the information with each other. Even even the men, even the there is no world government. That's uh, is 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 there something missing from that logic that that they can still watch? somehow each other's territory or traffic yeah i mean i, I think that's a, that's a good point but it it's it what paul is assuming or tor assumes is that your threat model is this kind of locally bounded adversary so that you know your threat model is the chinese government and you're for example an american and you want or a chinese dissident and you're trying to basically escape that adversary, which could only monitor a small portion of the network, maybe only the Tor entry points inside China. But once you're, you know, out of those of that network, they can't. It's unrealistic for China to to monitor the Tor exit nodes, which are mostly going to, let's say, Silicon Valley services, Facebook, Google, whatever, uh, Wikipedia. Um, that being said, I don't know. I don't think that means you need to throw entropy out because it's still a useful measure. And it's also true that even though maybe it's true that there's no world government that can monitor all the traffic all the time, you know, if I'm the U S government, I can still monitor a lot of entry nodes, most of the entry nodes, which are in Europe and in the United States. And I can definitely monitor the exit nodes which are in the United States and therefore these kind of timing correlation attacks that Paul basically says, well, they're just kind of theoretically interesting, but they're not practical. I think those are practical. And I think the reason is there's even been empirical studies of tour. Uh, I think uh, Stephen Murdoch was the first person to point this out that basically says, you know, because most tour nodes are in Europe and most users are Tor in the United States, and most big internet services are in the United States, if you actually look at Tor traffic, the majority of it is folks coming from the United States, having their traffic shipped over to Europe, going through a few relays in Europe and through the Chaos Computer Club or whatnot, 
and then being shipped back to America to access Google or Wikipedia or, you know, Amazon or whatever. And that's, I think, it, while it's unrealistic that an adversary can monitor maybe every single internet packet because, you know, China and the U.S. may not cooperate or Russia and the U.S. may not cooperate, it's probably true that they that given a certain user, they might be able to monitor a large portion, and that part portion is large enough to reasonably approximate a global passive adversary. Um, and so that's, I think, the lesson from that would be sort of something saying like, oh, well, you know, Tor is great if your enemy is the Chinese government. Well, it doesn't really work super well in China right now, but it's great if your enemy is like a Chinese government or the Iranian government or even the French government or... Um, you know, the Hungarian government or, you know, a government that doesn't have huge amounts of surveillance powers. But if your enemy is the United States government and you happen to be in Europe or the U.S. or somewhere that's, you know, not directly adversarial with them, you know, it, these attacks against Tor, I think, are, are not unrealistic. Does that make sense? Uh, yes, uh can I, since since you're here and, you know, we, we have some theoretical knowledge on mixed networks and, and such because we, we reviewed some papers regarding oh, DC nets, dining cryptographer networks, but, but you have more practical knowledge on that. And uh, it's it's not completely about this paper, but, but since you're here, I would like to ask you that... Uh, you know, let, let's let's make a let's let's make a difference there. That there, there is Tor traffic when you are accessing exit nodes, and there is Tor traffic when you are inside the Onion network and you are uh, accessing only Onion uh, nodes, Onion sites. Uh, how would you how would you say what's What's the difference there? Is is that ultimately safer, or or there are just just as huge holes according to you in in the privacy um, of of those when when you are accessing onion only? Yeah, I mean, I mean, one huge advantage that Tor has over mixed networks is this ability to essentially do web browsing and to have exit nodes. Just to be really clear, mixed networks are not by nature generically able to access any internet service because the internet by TCP IP by nature is kind of works in this sort of stream based format and mixnets mix every packet individually. Um, and so that doesn't work very well for stream based networks on some level. I just want to, I just want to say, I mean, Tor, I think, may even be some sort of local optima. It might be the best you can do for web browsing, and I think it's it. it you, you need. I, I'm not convinced that a lot of these decentralized VPN concepts, these other things I'm seeing thrown around, are ever going to be better than Tor, like I2P or I don't know. I saw this Orchid thing. I'm not convinced 100 percent that will that they're better than Tor. I think it's interesting they exist, but and maybe they have some incentive-based advantages, but they're not necessarily going to be better. That being said, uh, Tor Onion services are definitely, would definitely be more secure because you're always inside the Tor network so you don't have these exit nodes that the NSA or the MAN or, you know, the Chinese government or whoever could monitor very easily. Um, and I think, you know, you do have hidden services, you know, inside the Tor network and there can be attacks on, there can be attempts to de-anonymize with hidden services. And there's been a lot of research on that in the last few years. And I, I would actually like to know from you guys if people still feel hidden services are safe. I still basically think they're safe and they work really well and are, are much safer than using a, a web route, uh, exit node to a non-hidden service. And, and it, it's an advantage toward that they work. And, and mixed networks, essentially every service inside of a mixed network has to be kind of a little bit like a hidden service because mixed network services don't easily interface with websites like the internet, generic internet services like Tor can provide. Um, so yeah, I mean, I know there's been a lot of attacks on things like dark markets and stuff um, over the last year or two that seemingly have gotten worse. 
Um, I, I don't. I'm, is anyone tracking those? I mean, th does there seem to be any systematic issues with Tor hidden services? I would definitely say they're safer than not using them, but I'm not sure how they're holding up right now, like in the real world. I don't really hear news about people getting de-anonymized uh, because of Tor. Uh, and it might not be because Tor is so secure, but because there are just so many low-hanging fruits that uh, that they can, can go after. Like, ooh, the statistics is 60% of all darknet market users send the money from darknet markets to know your customer exchanges directly. So, I mean, why would you try to de-anonymize the Tor network <laughs> when you have you have such a low-hanging fruits there to to catch, right? Yeah, it, uh, I mean, another another point because you brought up DC nets is, I mean, let's just be very. There's basically like three fundamental categories of anonymous communication systems on the network level. Um, there's onion routing systems like Tor, which are effectively are, are kinds of what operate effectively as a kind of decentralized VPN, let's say, for a stream-based, uh, circuit-based message, uh, internet traffic. There's mixed nets, which basically mix messages. And a lot of the critique of Paul against mixed nets is he says, well, look, you know, that that's those, those threat models are very re unrealistic and no one really uses them in the real world, while Tor provides this very practical benefit in terms of anonymity against what he considers to be realistic adversaries. And he's definitely right. Uh, and, but DC nets are interesting. So DC nets without any argument uh, provide uh, in sorry, theory the third better category. anonymity than mixed networks. I mean, they do. There's, there's kind of no question there because everyone kind of does a computation uh, on the same packets. But then I think, a lot of the critiques that Paul has against mixed networks, I would say mixed network technology has evolved enough that those critiques may not be necessary anymore. We'll talk about that maybe next time. But that those critiques are still very plausible against DC nets because DC nets, you know, have this problem where everyone has to send the messages at the same time and to, to all the other participants. And in real world networks, that, that's really hard. Um, so I'd like to know what people think about DC nets here. Like I think Decred was working on one. I know Sarah from the Open Privacy Foundation is working on one. Are people interested in DC nets or trying to use them? Uh, the thing is, at least my conclusion when we reviewed we reviewed the DC nets paper and we reviewed uh, Coin Shuffle Plus Plus, which provides a DC net uh, for Bitcoin mixing and what he said there is that well message sizes must be uniform uh, that's that's kind of that's obvious but the other thing is uh, they argued that and I'm not sure I understood why but they argued that that messages must be fresh messages must be always fresh and you cannot do a DC net that works properly if the messages are not fresh. And with CoinShuffle, they actually uh, started with Decred. Oh, no, no, that was Decent, not Decred. Oh, sorry, then I don't know about Decred. But, but yeah, the argument was there. If, if the messages are not fresh, then you cannot do do DC nets, which kind of means that it's it's useless for communications, but for for their Bitcoin purposes was was uh, was good. That any anyone else uh, remembers differently? All right. So yeah, yeah I mean, one way to think about DC nets is that you know it's like. Like you said, this is a very good example. On paper, they have they're resistant to more attacks and are more anonymous than mixed nets and tor. No questions asked. But I think you know one of the points Paul's making is he doesn't really talk about DC nets and why I'm not an entropist, is that even if you had a DC net, 
that had this like kind of theoretically wonderful entropy and worked against these theoretically very powerful threat models. The fact of the matter is because it has these kind of assumptions around fresh messages and synchronous message passing and stuff, it's a, a really good system on paper, but it's unclear if any system that you'd actually build would actually be anonymous in any real sense that was based on DCNet. While Tor is the reverse. Tor on paper you know, may not have very formal definitions, may not seem to be that anonymous, but has been this huge real-world success story. So even though I'm working on a mixnet, when the folks from like Mimblewimble, some of them approached me and they said, well, what should, you know, Mimblewimble has this like interactive step in it, which is obviously something that needs network level privacy. And when they approached me, they said, well, should we use a mixnet or Tor? I said, I think, you know, mixnet in the future is fine, but for what you're doing right now, Jesus, you've already deployed Mimblewimble this is a very dangerous attack on, on your transaction privacy. So in the name of God, use an anonymous communication network with the largest possible uh, anonymity set and that therefore the largest possible number of users. So you should use Tor right now rather than wait around for the NIM mixnet or try to build your own DC net or something like that. And I think that's, you know, to be honest, still the case for all systems. I, I still think it's, for a lot of systems, I mean, Tor works has tons of users now, and that shouldn't be thought about. So, from a from a Bitcoin perspective, I guess what is like? So I read lots of papers about uh, anonymous Bitcoin transactions and new kinds of privacy hands cryptocurrency. But I I think in reality, like what you said, most people use Bitcoin and they use mixers. What what are most people actually using, like in the real world, that provides? good enough anonymity basically yeah that's pretty much it some people use monero most people use exchanges oh uh, yeah uh casinos and and exchanges they use exchanges as mixers so so so, so, so can you explain a little how would you, you you use an exchange as a mixer just by transferring the, the coin around a bunch and Oh no, you send it to an exchange and then you withdraw it and that magically yeah. became anonymous. Yeah. yeah, you just withdraw to a new address and that's it. Yeah, so it doesn't provide you any anonymity against the actual service provider just for the outsiders, right? Okay, yeah. so on some level the store, like they're just minting new addresses basically and the exchange is mediating that transaction. Exactly. It's it's not uh, not rocket science. So yeah, it's basically but, like what people but imagine it works. stealth addresses, <laughs> but manually created with an exchange. Yeah. And and how's the real world attacks on this stuff going? So I had a Anya who's a, who was working on uh, uh, the Lupix and NimmixNet. She she actually weirdly enough used to work for Chainalysis. Um, and my understanding is that it's still very difficult for Chainalysis to break most mixers and Monero. I don't know what the extent they are. I mean, I, I, I still feel it seems like even these very simple techniques, I wouldn't really use them or advise them to use them, but they, they might. I mean, I don't know. Are, are you seeing any evidence these techniques are being broken, that exchanges are watching out for this behavior pattern and or what's going on i mean what's the real world analysis no i i don't think it can be broken um i mean uh, I, if we are talking about wasabi wallet specifically it cannot be broken because the amounts are equal so so that's it but then uh, people start merging their coins together so that when when some people do some really stupid things, like they come with, I don't know, 10,000 Bitcoin and mixing with five, 20 different clients for two days and then mix all their coins together, that's when they get obviously the anonymized because, well, you can't hide an elephant between a bunch of children. Now, it's a good question if, if some people who, who merge a bunch of coins together, like tens or hundreds of coins, 
if they get de-anonymized in the same way too, like the very big guy, and I'm not quite sure. I tried a couple of times, but it's it's computationally infeasible to to try to to find the valid valid matchings. Uh, so I'm I'm not. Qu- I think it is definitely not getting de-anonymized in practice. And even with people who are using it very incorrectly, they don't get de-anonymized because it's computationally expensive. And they are not trying to find solutions. They are not trying to to de-anonymize at all because of the same thing that I just said that. Most people are sending money from darknet markets to exchanges and, and there is just so many low-hanging fruits that they, they aren't even trying, it seems. So what they settled with is that they start to flag transactions as suspicious uh, if, if they get mixed, uh, regardless if it's even a change change address that's obviously that's not even trying to be anon- anonymized but like you know it's it's just a change address but if it's coming out of the mix then they just flag it as suspicious and consider it as as the same as as all the other coins those actually gain some anonymity by mixing so it's it's interesting i i don't know when they will actually start uh, looking into it but it doesn't seem to be the case for now well anyway let's let's be ahead of them instead of behind (laughs) oh okay so oh my god we are really getting out of this paper but i just want to ask you this so uh, and you might be interested in this question of mine too because you know, in Wasabi, we ship it with Tor, uh, with the Tor daemon, and we are communicating with the backend server uh, through the Tor daemon. Of course, our backend is running over Onion. Anyway, the thing is that in coin joins, many people come together, and then the round phases have some timeouts. And actually, all the Bitcoin privacy research projects have demonstrated that oh we can do our rounds in 12 seconds and things like that and in practice at least in wasabi or 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 anywhere it's always the slowest peer that that uh, that blocks the round and we started to log how 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 much someone is delayed and it seems like our timeouts has to be around 12, uh, around 1 minute 20 seconds or, or 2 minutes or, yeah, maybe 2 minutes. So the slowest peer that responds, it takes him 2 minutes. So my question would be, what, is there any faster anonymity network that we could utilize instead of Tor that is like consistently fast for everyone and the slowest peer doesn't block the whole round? Um, j- 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 I mean, I'm a little bit, so are you saying that, that the Tor network you think is slowing stuff down enough that that's causing more than a minute delay? It's very fast usually. So yeah, there are fifty true. people in a round, or let's say one hundred, and ninety people responds within ten seconds. So who cares? But the remaining ten is just very very slow, and they are blocking the round. So the rounds cannot progress as fast as we would hope to. And, uh, and and do you think those are Tor people being blocked by Tor, or is just that's like an hypothesis that Tor might be part of it, the blocking? No, I, I believe it's it's people from some strange countries, or or just the route is going through some strange country. Ah, that yeah, that might down. be the case. 
So it's actually there's there's this great website about Tor called metrics.torproject.org, and that lets you sort of see the the kind of average um, uh, latencies in, in Tor in terms of um, you know at least retrieving uh, what uh, different files and different servers and it, it basically says you know currently. You're you're not really seeing anything above more than a, a second, a few seconds uh, delay. Um, it looks like one second delay uh, round trip. So my minutes, suspicion would be that we're talking about the problem. The, the problem is that that's exactly what you said. That that that, that if there's the problem of Tor, if you, are you forcing everyone to use Tor in your network? Yes. Okay. So the the, the issue there is that. Is exactly what you said that if someone, because the majority of Tor entry and exit nodes are not evenly geographically dispersed. So if I'm in a weird country, uh, let's say I'm in, I don't know, a, uh, I'm just going to make one, I'm just going to guess. Let's say I'm in uh, Western Samoa. Um, the nearest Tor entry node, I mean, there might not even be an entry node in Western Samoa, it might have to go all the way to Hawaii and then, you know, bounce to Japan and then bounce to Europe and then bounce back to the U S and then to the, uh, the, the wasabi mix. And it seems to me, and this, this has been our practical experience with mixed networks in NIM is that the, the giant slowdowns almost always come from, from certain geographical places running, uh, running, um, nodes which have just a, a huge latency problem and that problem actually has nothing to do with tor it just either has to do the a certain hop in the tor circuit or more likely the end user themselves is in a, a, a jurisdiction or location which doesn't have great tor access so the way we attack that problem in the nim mix that is we say well you know if, if you're not satisfying a certain kind of quality of service we kick you out um but then, you know, it, that, the Tor network is a, a volunteer-run network, so it, it's it's harder, to some extent, to remove poor-performing relays, relay, Tor no, relays that built to have circuits which may not be working uh, very well. So I think it's a trade-off. Um, I, it, it should always... I mean, the, the, the thing with Tor circuits... Is one way you could maybe solve this problem. I forget how long it takes to build a new tour circuit, but it's, you know, it's on the order of a few seconds. But if you're if you're if you only need timing delays of a minute, if someone's slow, it also helps in terms of privacy. You should probably force everyone to rebuild their tour circuit at every round, and so everyone's going to have to slow down what appears to be an initial slowdown to rebuilding their tour circuit. But they would have better privacy because the, then the Tor circuits between rounds would be much harder to connect. And then maybe you could do some sort of test where you test people's latency very quickly. Somehow, I have to think about how to do that. You know, just send the byte back, send the byte forward before letting them do the coin join. So you could detect people who are in these, as you put it, these kind of strange locations which have huge slowdowns or happen to have Tor circuits that go through these strange locations. It's a, it's a good idea. Um, oh, yeah, by the way, we are changing Tor streams uh, extremely frequently. Like, if you have five outputs to register, then you are going to change Tor streams uh, very quickly. And what I realized from my unit test that you can ask Tor to change its stream and it's going to change 90% of the times, but for 10%, it's just going best effort and just put it, put you to the exact same stream where you were before. But anyway, it's just... Uh, yeah, and, 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 and Tor's not trying to be a jerk. I think that's actually my understanding, because I've noticed that as well, is that Tor is doing a lot of they're trying to avoid these slow circuits. So they're doing a lot of bandwidth balancing and it happens to be in Tor, there's a few Tor nodes which have a lot of capacity. So 
you know, if it's too expensive to build a new circuit or it, they're trying to optimize your, your – and there's a certain frequent number of circuits, you're, you're going to just keep using those again and again because they work well, which is kind of backwards. But I think that's why – I would bet that's why that's happening. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh, anyway, guys, let's get back to the paper <laughs> about that. And, oh, it's already – an hour into this conversation oh my god time is flying um yes yeah, so so, so do, do you guys have uh, anything what what did you take away from this paper or just just some interesting things like like anonymity is also one area of security that is much younger for example than confidentiality or or any quotes like this from the paper. Hmm. That's a long silence there. So let's see. You know, uh, I just wanted to uh, point out the uh, thing that Harry mentioned previously about, uh, you know, how Torque works and all of that. I, th I just think that. I'm not sure what's the good way to quantify uh, the anonymity of Tor or even like precisely for Bitcoin. But I just think the main point would be to have enough honest or not malicious uh, Tor exit nodes and also for people to uh, like on and off ramps in Bitcoin also without KYC. I mean, that's what I think the biggest threat for this, uh, like the man attack, uh, for just, you know, looking at the network. I mean, they can, uh, do the forcing and all the other stuff like locally, if, uh, needed for true ISPs or to wallet services, uh, service providers or something like that. If people ain't, uh, using their own node, but yeah, I just, I think that's a, a pretty interesting idea. Mm -hmm. Oh, there is, uh, I just found this quote. I wrote it to myself that, um, yeah, I just read it. It's, it concerns our previous conversation and it might settle something. Given the fundamental differences in mechanisms they, deep, they employ, the adversaries they are intended to resist and their basic designs, not to mention typical applications, it might seem impossible or at least astonishing that anyone who works in this area would ever confuse the two. Yet, for years, it has been common for publications by even top researchers in anonymity communication to refer to onion routing networks as mixnets or vice versa. Even we designers of onion routing systems have been exceptionally guilty of failing into this idiom. So, yeah, he, he wants to differentiate uh, onion routing and mixnets uh, <laughs> completely. Yeah, and I mean, I, I think the best quote that I found in the paper. Um, which I think is this Paul's strongest point is he says, well, you know, you know, mixed net should be used. This is on page at least 13 from the Freehaven PDF. A uh, mixed net and entropy can be used for applications where it's possible to manage and to measure sets of distinct users and anonymity providers and the probability distributions on their behaviors with voting being a clear example. But for general internet use, they are overkill against almost every adversary except unrealistic ones, which is where me and Paul disagree, like the global passive adversaries, or incredibly strong ones like, quote-unquote, the man. And because of usability incentive limitations, in practice, they do not scale enough to protect against the man anyways. On the other hand, a widely distributed network like Tor may already offer better, although still inadequate protection. Um, so that's uh, yeah, that's his argument. His argument is we really need to worry. It's it, and this is an argument which I think 
Bitcoin is actually ahead was ahead of anonymous communication research and 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 also the, the the general field of like consensus algorithms. Consensus algorithms are always concerned about you know what percentage of nodes have to be compromised to destroy consensus or to you know destroy the system in, in general. And that's typically you know people in security and to some extent anonymous communication research tend to think kind of more in all or nothing. And actually, it's kind of these local attacks where you say, oh, assume the enemy's compromised some large section of the network, but not the whole network. Those are, I think, realistic. And, and, and you know, the, the, the cryptocurrency community has a lot to, to teach the anonymous communications community here. It's an, and um, I, I don't know if Paul's even looking at anonymous cryptocurrency, but I think some of the same insights about kind of real world anonymity versus on paper anonymity is definitely applies to both crypto and the tour. Interesting thoughts. I, I'm more on the, the side of rather the crypto community should be looking into anonymous communications more because I don't think we know enough. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I definitely agree there. I, I, I'm a bit shocked that there hasn't been more people looking into it. I remember a long time ago, I think there was some rumor that Chainalysis was running lots of the kind of um, uh, full nodes and seed nodes. Yes, 10%. Is that, is that definitely true? Or I mean, it's that, been a rumor for a long time, but I had trouble figuring it out. That was definitely true. There was a whistleblower but uh, he said it was around 2014-15. But uh, he also said that now it's like they can't, they, they, they don't run, run almost, they don't run much. Yeah, I mean, I would think that that's a pretty big risk if they could run enough of nodes. But good to know. I mean... They can't really get that much information out of that. The transaction broadcasting stuff is pretty hard to figure out. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, not specifically just that, but for example, if they have a lot of nodes, they have a lot of information about the network itself, and a lot of people use KYC, I don't think it matter, matter that's, uh, that much if there are this, like, let's say, 10 or 20% peop of people that are not using these KYC exchanges and using mixing services. I mean, they are pretty easy to narrow down anyway. I mean, the, the biggest threat is if they get a big mass to surveil. I don't know. That's just my intuition. So why, why it was a huge problem? Because the blue filtering wallets were the ones who but everyone was pushing and... Uh, and it turned out to be a huge privacy risk if there is a huge adversary who is trying to collect a bunch of bloom filters now what what might be the largest risk the transaction broadcasting part that uh, they might try to identify where the transactions coming from but but the electrum server part right that that uh it, <laughs> Electrum servers know everything about Electrum users, and Electrum users are there are a lot. So that's that could be that could be the largest problem there. Yeah, yeah, that exactly has been one of my uh, like uh, things that I've been uh, worried about. Also, um, the amount of uh, Electrum nodes just run up from by these blockchain blockchain analysis companies. Yeah, it's an interesting conversation. So what what's better, centralized backend servers or Electrum servers? Those are decentralized. But, you know, <laughs> I, I would say we ha we need both. Uh, but, you know, we just it would be even better if we could just somehow like, uh, I don't know, evolve into even a a better conclusion or solution. I mean, just <laughs> let's I mean, think have... about something outside of the box. We have client side filtering, of course. <laughs> oh yeah, of course. 
Anyway, um, thank you guys. This was a really interesting conversation. And oh, uh, anyone would like to to talk about anything before before I I say goodbye? I'm good. Thanks. Yeah, this yeah, was. I want to say thanks. Uh, thanks for inviting me. I'll I'll forward out um, the Lupix paper and the Nim link uh, after the meeting. And um, yeah, I think it should be a good follow up to to how uh, the Mixnet community responded. I think to a lot of these critiques, which I think are at the time they're written at least were very correct uh, from Paul in this why I'm not an entropist paper. So this paper is actually, I think hugely important. And I, I, I'm really glad you, you brought it up because it, it does really distinguish between again, you know, why certain real world systems have really good anonymity properties and how certain systems which seem that, that would be, they would be better might not. But then at the same point, I, the, what I want to try to say is that, you know, that doesn't mean you should just throw all the metrics out. That means you should try to me make the metrics more realistic and, you, and improve the system um, that you, you currently have. So it, the, because the, the, the thing about threat models, particularly things like the global passive adversary, this person that's watching all the peer to peer broadcasts or watching all the internet traffic, even, you know, even if you said, Hey, the NSA is watching our traffic. Even if you said that right before Snowden in 2012, People would think you're a bit crazy, but then it ends up actually hard drive space is cheap, analysis is quite good, and you have something which is very much more powerful than what people thought. That there were very few attacks on cryptography, but there was because it was easy to do and because hard drive space is cheap, we do know the NSA was capable of doing mass metadata and traffic analysis. And I would assume that's the same case for cryptocurrency, even though we might not have as much evidence. Um, and so we shouldn't, even though even if a threat model seems unrealistic, we really should think what is likely realistic given just what is actually cheap. It's going to be very hard to, to break a digital signature or to, you know, anything like that. But it might be easy to just block a transaction or go after seeding a node or you know go after a central server and these are the things that enemies are going to do so that's a wonderful ending there and and harry left i think it's internet connection anyway i'm stopping the recording thank you guys and woman uh <laughs> and have a good Good day, good night. Bye bye. Thanks, guys. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye, guys. Thank you.